Um, so thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Knut, and I'd like to show you a small project I did called Locker. And I'd like to show you how it works, and especially why it works in exactly that, that manner. Um, so at the time that this project came about, I was working for a company called Vuga, the social, social games. It's one of, actually one of the biggest social gaming companies out there. Um, only dwarfed by Zynga. Uh, and we were doing the first real-time multiplayer game of the company. So we had done games before that had multiplayer parts to them, uh, but this was the first real-time multiplayer game. Um, and our servers are a bit special in that they are stateful. Uh, so instead of having the typical two-tier architecture where you have a stateless application service up front, uh, talking to a bunch of database servers or services in, of some sort. Um, we actually put a lot of state inside of the game server while the user is online playing. Um, so typ a typical session would be a few minutes. Um, and while the user is online, all of the state is inside of the application server. And at the end of the session, we store it back down into the database. Um, and this, this multiplayer game, um, we, we model it with Erlang processes. And we have one process per user uh, containing the user state and the push channel to the client. So client is a, is a HTTP uh, flash thing. Um, so it speaks HTTP to us. And um, we have a push channel that we send real-time updates. And this is then contained inside of the user process. And we also have some metadata about the user, like the inventory that is used inside of the game and so on. Um, and it's a multiplayer game, so we also have a world process. Um, and you can have many users in one world at a time, all doing stuff, so they can build buildings and whack trees and stuff like this. Um, and these updates that are propagated out to the other users in the same game world. Um, so there's many, there's many challenges when doing these kind of uh, projects. And Locker was created to address one specific of these challenges. And that challenge is that you need to have only one process per user and per world. Um, and the reason for this is that we cannot reconcile conflicting game worlds. Uh, so if it would happen to have two instances of the exact same game world uh, making different progress, so in one world we add one building and in another one we remove a building, um, we don't have a way of reconciling these together uh, in the product point of view. So technically, you can merge stuff and resolve conflicts, but in the product point of view, it doesn't make any sense. So we can't do this um, at the moment. So they were pushing, at the moment, we were trying to push this forward um, from a product point of view, but, but it's actually a, a really hard product from the user experience point of view. So it didn't really, uh, we couldn't really do it. Um, and so we, we wanted to have some kind of strong consistency system to help us ensuring we only had one instance of each each game world. Um, and it, this is more like an application of, of uh, distributed coordination systems. And we want to have one that was very fine-grained. Since we're going to have hundreds of thousands of these users online um, at any given point, um, it to, to pushes us towards a fine-grained solution instead of a coarse grain where you might have five locks, for example. Um, and there's another very important use case um, is that we need to find um, when we, have, when we know we want to send an update to a specific user, we need to find that user ID um, mapping to a process, an Erlang process. Um, so we need kind of a lookup table to, to do that. Um, that's the other use case. Um, so the way this works then in, in the physical world is that um, assume we have two clients um, and they all want to visit um, the same game world at the same time. So we have two concurrent clients accessing the same resource. Um, in our system, since it's stateful, we will then spawn up a process to, to deal with this, and which will then go and fetch the, the state of that world and load up the game logic and everything. Um, but the problem is that suddenly we, we now have two of these processes, and, and, and this simply doesn't work for us. So we need to ensure that we kill one and continue with the other one. Um, so then we have what we call a lock. Um, and it's some kind of arbiter among racing, uh, racing transactions. Um, and the goal of the lock is that, it, uh, that both world processes will ask the lock 
the locking system to um, acquire the lock for that specific world, um, one of them will fail uh, and another one will be okay. That's the goal. Like one will be okay and everybody else will fail. That's the, that's the goal. Um, and the result of this is that both clients can now talk to the one and true instance of that world. So a big theme here for us is to avoid um, two, uh, two worlds where we make uh, conflicting updates in both of them. Um, since we want to have like, a consistent uh, view of the world, we all users need to go and talk to the same process. Um, so we, we did this already once, um, but, but this was the first game we had, and I was, was mentioned in the previous talk, sometimes in the gaming companies there's time pressure to, to deliver things. And that was the case in this first game, that we wanted to get something out there on the market quickly, and so we decided we will make, take some shortcuts. Um, and now we are now doing the next generation of games. So this is then a year ago, but at that point we were then doing the next generation of the game. Uh, and then we wanted to actually go back and, and fix those big uh, technical uh, um, loans. Um, and what we did was we had a central serialization point um, that had uh, atomic operations that could compare and swap and then set a new value. And we used Redis for this. So we had one Redis instance that was like the central component in our system. Um, also, a single point of failure, um, and this part would then um, kind of be our uh, arbiter of, of concurrency and solve all of our racing uh, uh, user process trying to get those locks. Um, and then in the next generation of game, we wanted to have higher availability than what this single point of failure would give us. Um, we didn't want to go all the way and kind of have the React style or Dynamo style of high availability. We wanted to have something that was more available than a single point of failure. Um, and the, the reason for this is that um, when you're kind of operating a service like this, uh, you find yourself living with failure all around you all the time. Um, and hardware specifically fails quite often. Um, so we were running this on EC2 and nodes will kind of disappear and Amazon will decommission instances and uh, data centers will go down and regions will go down. Um, so sometimes it fails. Um, the network is, uh, is mostly okay. Um, sometimes there's uh, a few seconds where suddenly network is very slow, um, or there's minutes where the network is down. Sometimes you're just arbitrarily losing packets. Um, but most of the time, it's kind of OK. Um, and our software is almost bug-free. And the software we use is almost bug-free. And sadly, though, especially this, most bugs happen in the, in the error path of your code. So let's say a database is down, for example. Uh, you're, not now use, you're no longer using your happy path, you're using your uh, error handling path, and that's where we had the most bugs. Even though we were specifically testing many of those cases, since it's um, less executed in the real system, we would simply have more bugs there. So one of the nice things of, of doing these games, or doing systems that have very high throughput, is that you kind of exercise all of the code paths pretty quickly. So every time we would deploy a new version of our game, in, after a few seconds we would know if there were bugs in our code, for example. But in the paths that were not often taken, in the error handling paths, they were not that frequently tested. So we would often crash there. Um, despite this, though, uh, our short time was pretty often quite short. Uh, so it would be everything from half an hour to a few hours. Um, and for other games that also had single point of failures, they would typically take longer, where they might have some database that was a single point of failure. Um, let's say a big MySQL installation, for example. So they could have downtimes of days to recover. Um, yeah, so we had this, uh, this uh, single point of failure, and uh, that combined with these failures all over the place made our life really suck. Um, uh, development, though, was pretty easy, since it's very easy to reason about what value is inside of this one central thing. It's easy to debug it. You can easily inspect it. It has these atomic operations. There's no eventual consistency. It's all instant, so it's easy to develop. But um, the operations part of your system, of, of our system, was just totally sucking. Um, and, and one of the, the big things was that it was hard for us to, to change uh, this, this very important part of our system. Um, so they were, they were it's, whenever you want to change something, there's also the risk that you, you mess it up. Um, and we kind of had this big fear then of messing up our central point of failure. Um, so we wanted to avoid changing, and this is really bad when you want to be in, like, in a fast-paced product development environment. Um, when we would mess up uh, from the operation point of view that you would 
crash the wrong node or something would happen, you would misconfigure or something. Um, the repercussions of this is, is really high if you have this single, single point of failure. So once that thing goes down, then kind of everything is messed up. And it leads to a situation where you need to fix all of your problems immediately. So there's no saying, I will do it when I get back from lunch, I will do it when I get back to work on Monday, or I will do it when I have sobered up after this party. Um, it needs to happen now um, because your whole, or our whole game will be down. So um, with this in mind, we sat, around, sat, sat down and we started um, uh, thinking, what uh, do we need from this, this new next generation system, uh, specifically in terms of, of throughput and so on. So we have a lot of data about how the game performs. And from this, we can then uh, extrapolate what we think this next game is going to perform like. And that's exactly what we did. Um, so we figured we're going to need to do 10,000 conditional updates per second. Um, and three million reads per second. And obviously this doesn't make much sense to do that many reads on a central system, so uh, we want to have a local replica where we can do the reads instead. Um, so a, a local replica on each application node. And then it would be only 150,000 per second. Um, as a safety mechanism, um, if a owner of a lock dies, or the node that that process is running on dies, we want the lock to, to clean itself up and just disappear after some uh, set amount of time. So that when the user comes back, um, he, can, or he or she can continue playing the game without having to wait for us to fix whatever problem that was, uh, uh, was occurring. Um, and uh, a really big thing is that we want to have a dynamic cluster. So we want to be able to add new nodes into this thing and help out with, uh, with the load. Um, and we want to be able to remove old nodes that we no longer want to run. Um, so we, we shopped around and we figured, okay, Zookeeper, that's the best alternative we had. And we looked at a lot of different things and, uh, and Zookeeper was hands down the best option. Um, but it had a lot of things that we didn't like. Um, and specifically since we had been thinking about a year, year in Magic and we had been thinking about what should our dream system look like? What should the next step be? A next step towards the perfect system, what should that be? Um, we found ourselves thinking, um, what instead would the alternative to Zookeeper be if we said we don't want to use Zookeeper? Um, and our system looks like this. Uh, we have a bunch of application servers, we have some load balancers, and we have a different databases. So we use hosted stuff from Amazon, and we could use React, and we could use MySQL and whatever, but we buy these services from Amazon. Um, and this is how we want the system to look like. This is the perfect system in our mind. So we have these application servers. Then we say that five of them uh, become special. So they're all running the same uh, application code, but they have an inherent capability of becoming special. So we promote some nodes to become masters. So we call them masters, but really it, it, could, be, it could be whatever. They could call them an ensemble, for example, from, some, from Zookeeper. Um, and then the idea would be that we um, do writes onto these nodes uh, in the same way that, that React does it. Um, that we say, okay, the replication factor is five, so there's no partition or anything. We just write everything on all the nodes. Um, and the write value is three, so we need three nodes to agree to have a quorum. Um, maybe specifically this would be a PW equals three. Um, and so the idea is that when one crashes uh, or one gets split away, um, which you can treat them as the same, same case in this case, um, we simply do not need to do anything. We can just ignore this because we still are able to make quorums. Um, and then when a second one uh, crashes, um, then we might start thinking about solving this somehow. But still we have enough nodes to make a quorum. Um, but then when the third one crashes or spits away, and now we kind of get into a dangerous area here, um, if all of them has physically crashed, what we can do then is that we can promote another of our application nodes to become a new master. And eventually then replace the, all the down nodes. So that, that this is a bit tricky, but if they're all crashed, we can do this. Um, so the idea would be that um, when nodes start crashing, we don't really care. When we come in on Monday, we simply promote some new nodes to become the masters, and then at our own leisure, we will fix those that, that are dead for whatever reason. And, and this, we could, not, we could not do this with Zookeeper. 
Um, and we wanted something that we can run inside of our application servers. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. One is that we have a bunch of stuff already in place to, to instrument and debug and monitor these high throughput applications. So we have done our own web server, we have our own statistic collecting library and so on, we have our own database drivers, and they're all geared toward high throughput and low latency. Um, and we wanna use um, the same tools we use to monitor those to monitor this thing. Um, so the goal being that we wanna have very simple operations. So the task is very um, ambitious uh, in terms of development, but the end result for, the, for operations would be that we would have a dead simple system. Um, so we sat down and we thought, okay, how hard can this be? Like, is it really as hard as everybody says it is? Um, and and uh, yes, it, it is extremely hard. Um, distributed systems are very, very hard. There's people who have their whole uh, careers in academia dedicated to figure out the smaller part of how distributed systems work. And there's whole companies centered around making distributed database that actually works and so on. Um, and luckily though for us, there's a bunch of books and papers on the topic. So there's a lot of liter literature where we can go and learn. Um, and there's specifically also in the Erlang community, there's uh, the React database, which we um, found was a very good example of the mindset uh, of creating distributed systems, where you are very honest about the trade-offs and you think what happens during failure and so on. And this is like a part of every discussion of every future is what happens when things fail. Um, so, so although Eureka is on the other side of the consistency availability trade-off than what we wanted to achieve, it was still very useful to look at the community and the code and everything. Uh, so we came up with this idea that we are going to pick just the algorithm that fix, uh, fits the different problems the best. I mean, just pick and mix and match from, from literature and from, from React and Dynamo and, and Zookeeper and so on. And then build the simplest thing that could possibly work. Um, and so our laundry list of problems and solutions look like this. Um, for consistency um, and, and having these conditional writes or conditional updates, uh, we figured we're just gonna serialize all the updates to each key. And this is what Zookeeper does and this is what happens in Paxos and so on. Uh, and to have the conditional writes, uh, we will do something similar to a two-phase commit where we have the voting phase and then the commit phase. Um, and then obviously if we are just one of these serialization points, we will not really be making a system that is more available than what we already had. Um, so for the availability part, um, we figured we would just have multiple of these serialization points. Um, and use a quorum in the voting phase of the transaction to coordinate the masters uh, or the serializers. Um, and then if we do not get enough votes to, to form that quorum, um, we do not make progress in the system, so we would then have a consistency, uh, we would then favor consistency over availability. So in terms of the cap theorem, we would have a CP system. Um, and for the local replica on each, inside of each application server, uh, we figured we would just replay the transaction log. So if you have used MySQL or any of these systems, that's the typical way of doing it, that you assume that if you start out with two identical databases and you apply the same writes in the same order, they will end up looking exactly the same. And this has then been proven to be true, so uh, we, we went to that, that way. Um, then for this idea about having the dynamic cluster, um, this we kind of then skirted around a bit and we said this is a bit out of the scope of what we want to do now. And we said we need to manually configure the cluster, uh, meaning that we need to say which nodes should become masters, and when one node fails, we need to say which other node should take its place. Um, and so this is a pretty steep trade-off um, and a pretty steep omission from, from, uh, from the system we wanted to build, but um, there was just simply no way we could pull this off in time if we wanted to do the, the proper thing. Um, and then as a, as a helper for, for all of these trade-offs we were making, we wanted to have an anti-entropy mechanism um, that would push our system into a well-known good state or push all the replicas into sync and push all the masses into sync. Um, and here, since we want to uh, touch up each lock, in, in our specific use case, it was every minute. Um, it means that after one minute, um, all the, the keys in the system has been written again. So when you add a new replica, for example, then after one minute, it should be um, up, up to speed and uh, in sync with others. 
So we, we set about implementing this thing and in a Friday afternoon we had a proof of concept that had the transactions and had the multiple masters and so on. And this looked, uh, looked very promising. Uh, so we spent some more time on this project and over a couple of months we spent around three weeks um, on, on doing like the replication and doing a lot of optimizations of the expiry and so on. Um, and in general we turned this into something we can run inside of our our application server in, a, in like a safe manner, so production quality in ours. Um, and we have a lot of tests for, for race conditions and, and failure conditions and so on. Um, and on R15 that we were using, uh, we were able to set up um, three nodes and trigger uh, messages so that they will all um, create races and, and uh, deterministically create the same race conditions all the time so we could test that the right thing happens in certain conditions and so on. Um, but this is a bit limited, so we gave some, uh, uh, an attempt at using proper for, for also trying this out. And we use it specifically for, for testing the race conditions in, in the, in the uh, voting phase and the commit phase and so on. Uh, and it was, it was quite helpful, but uh, it's not like, uh, it's, it's really hard to test a distributed system uh, in general and with proper in particular, it's, it's even harder. Um, and the whole thing is 330 lines of code. So I'm sure you're all thinking, let's go ahead and use it now. Um, it's on the Vuga's GitHub page. Um, but before you think that I'm just gonna use it and uh, build my next big thing on it, there's a lot of trade-offs here that you need to be aware of. Um, as I said a couple of times, we focus on consistency. So the system will be unavailable if there's not enough masters. Um, there's no persistency on disk. And this helps us with the complexity of this small part that we don't actually need to implement any checkpointing or, or anything like this. Um, and we just assume that enough masses will stay up to, to keep the state of the system. Um, which for us is a good trade-off since if, if our application service crashes and the lock goes down, um, the value of the things in the lock is lost. So the PIDs in the lock is lost anyway. So we need to rebuild from scratch anyway. Um, and then the biggest omission is that there is no group membership. So the cluster um, does not figure out on its own what is the view of the cluster. So there's no, like in, the, uh, in React where you have the gossiping of the, the, the ring state around, there's nothing like this. This needs to happen manually. Um, and as an operator, you set the masters, the replicas, and the quorum value. So you need to pay attention because you can easily set the quorum value to be one and have five masters. So um, you need to be, pay a bit of attention to this. Um, and while you're doing this, we assume that the network works perfectly which in our experience, it holds true because we don't do this that often, so, so it mostly it's fine. But if there would be a network problem, um, you might be screwed. Uh, and overall, it's not based on one algorithm, one, one described algorithm. It's more like a mashup between different ones. Um, and it's kind of, we kind of in our garage mashed it up, so beware of that too. Um, yeah, so with that in mind, here's how to use it and how, how it actually works. Um, so these are like the administration uh, functions that helps you setting up the cluster and whatnot. The most interesting function is the key, uh, the lock function. And it takes a key and a value and a least length. A least length is how long the lock will stay alive. So you might say a minute, you might say five seconds. Um, and before that time is up, you need to extend the lease of that lock. And when you put the value in here again, we can then do the conditional update. So if someone has changed it in the meantime, um, the extend will fail. Um, and then when you're done with the lock, you just say release. Um, and also if you happen to want to read where a certain, uh, what the, the value of a lock is, there's a function called dirty read. And it's called dirty read to emphasize that um, the value will always be stale, or most of the time it will be stale. So I will try to explain the implementation of the lock function and, and the two-phase commit and everything. Um, so in the prepare phase, we ask the masses for their vote. Um, and the idea being that uh, we do a conditional check here that um, let's say I wanna lock something and the value is not locked already, or the key is not locked already. I will say, give me a lock um, if, the if the database is empty. And the masses will then give a positive vote if that, that is true and a negative vote is not, if not. And if you have enough positive votes, uh, you can then go ahead and do the right. 
And if there's a timeout on doing this, we count that as a negative vote, which again puts our system in the consistency end of the spectrum. Um, and the, uh, the replication is done asynchronously in batch. And this is also configurable how often you want it to happen. Um, uh, well, what it means in practice is that you can call lock and it returns to you. Um, and then you do a read and the value is not there yet. And so there's a helper function called wait for that returns when the value has been propagated to the local replica. So you might have some other part of your system that assumes that you can always read a user ID, for example. And then the wait for will wait for that to be true. Um, so here's how it works. Um, the, the masters has uh, a list in the implementation is called the write locks. Really it is uh, uh, a temporary list of the votes that has been given out, the positive votes that has been given out. So that the master does not give the same vote to another transaction. Um, and let's assume that there's two clients here now. There's the blue guy and the green guy, and they both want to acquire the same lock. So they both want to lock the key foo. Um, so what they do is that they ask for acquiring this, the right lock, as we call it, which really means um, it asks for a quorum if it is allowed to proceed or not. And it says then the key, like the existing value should be not found. Um, and the masses would only give the lock then if the value really is not in the database. So the blue guy here, he goes ahead and he sends this message to all of the nodes. But let's say on the third node, the network is a bit slow or whatever, so it doesn't reach the third node yet. Um, the master one or two, they execute this command and they then give the positive vote to the blue guy. So they say that the key foo is now locked. Um, and then the green guy goes along and he sends the same command to all of the masses again. So I'm just not showing that, I'm only showing the message to master three. Um, and let's say now that the, the green guy reaches master three before the blue guy, then he gets that positive vote in the transaction. So when the blue guy actually now reaches the third master, um, that master sees that in this transaction, the, lock, the vote has already been given out and it gives them the negative vote. And in the implementation, um, the blue guy then gets two okay results and the green guy gets one. Um, and then the next step um, is to do the, the actual commit. Um, so now we see that um, the blue guy, he has two positive votes out of three, so he is allowed to continue, uh, while the green guy, he needs to stop, he needs to abort. So the blue guy goes ahead and then sends the right command to all of the masters, which then clear out their temporary locks. And that's it. And then if, if the last phase fails in some way, then there's a, some more edge cases, but I'm happy to discuss that after, later if you want to know more. So um, locker um, can be used, but I mean, you are, you are free to use it, I will help you, but you should be aware of the trade-offs I mentioned earlier. Um, but it's very useful uh, if you need strong consistency. And this is sometimes, sometimes you need strong consistency. Um, and for us, it's uh, to protect these precious resources we have and ensure that we don't have concurrent accesses to those. And it, it could also be that you want to protect a certain part of a code, for example, like a mutex or something like this. Um, you can also use it for leader election. Uh, so let's say you have one special key that is I am the master of this service or I am the, the master of this uh, particular table or whatever. Um, then you might have a bunch of nodes that are all trying to grab that specific key continuously. And then when the master that currently owns the lock, when it dies or it fails to renew the key, then someone else is free to grab that key. So it's a bit more stupid leader election than like the proper thing. Um, we can also use it for, for service discovery, um, which also we kind of use it, we use it also to find where certain resources are, or certain services are. Um, but let's say you, you want to have a central system where you look up where your database cluster is, where the IP address of a database load balance is, or something like this, you could use it for that. So after we had uh, implemented this thing and we had tried it out and we had tested it and so on, we kind of found ourselves thinking, okay, is it actually any good? I mean, obviously it works, 
the, all of the race conditions works and so on. We do the correct thing all of the time as far as we know. Uh, but still, there might be a lot of things that we, we just don't know about yet. Um, so we went around to a bunch of people that are kind of experts on the topic of distributed systems and we asked them and some say that yes, it is good and some say that no, it's not good. And in, in common, they all, they all have that, the trade-off of the group membership that's too steep of a trade-off to really be useful. And it's uh, something I can, and I can agree with. So you should be aware of that when, if you say you want to use it. And if anybody has opinions, let's say you make a living out of selling distributed databases, I will be happy to discuss anything offline. Um, so let's uh, try to, I will try to draw some conclusion remarks here, um, some philosophical remarks. Um, and so when we set out, we asked, okay, how hard can it be? We thought, how hard can it actually be to implement this thing in a robust manner that actually works? Um, and it turns out that it is, it is very hard. Um, it wasn't maybe as impossible as we thought, um, but it was certainly much harder than we expected. Um, because distributed systems are inherently hard. There's so many things that can go wrong and so many edge cases that you just don't know about before you experience them unless you do like the academic approach to them and really think about everything up front. Um, and we had, since we didn't do this group membership thing, it became much easier for us. And we focused only on the consistency part and we only, we assumed that most of the time everything will be kind of semi okay. And that's the problems we want to deal with. Um, and looking back, we could maybe have made Zookeeper work. Um, so our, I, our, the throughput we needed from the system might have been too much for Zookeeper, but it might be that we could actually have made it work somehow. Um, and also Zookeeper is like true and tested and there's, there's a lot of problems, but it is true and tested and there's a lot of effort behind it. So, so I mean, that's also in the favor of Zookeeper. Um, but we now have our, our dream system. Um, and most importantly, we have a system that we can operate in a very efficient manner, in a very simple manner. So this ambitious and even naive project um, actually led to an architecture that we can operate in a very scalable and simple and efficient manner. Thank you. Um, so the question is, what do we do is for communication between the nodes? Um, and our application is already using the Erlang distribution. So we already have a fully connected Erlang cluster of all application nodes. And Locker just simply uses that thing again. Um, and it runs a registered process on each node. So it knows where, you know, if it knows the node name, it knows it can use the Locker name to address that process. Which is also helps with the 330 lines of code. Any more questions? Can you talk about some of the edge cases that you fear for the scan of that Erlang model? Uh, so, um, so yes, so um, there's things that can go wrong. What we have seen is that there was a bug in the lock expiration that has since been fixed. That's the only thing we have seen gone wrong. And I mean, it's, we have done a lot of tests and a lot of load tests. The game that is using Locker um, is going live like really almost today. Um, it has been uh, in this, um, um, what do you call it, like a, a private live phase. So, I mean, it is used in production um, and it will go live for real soon. Um, and we haven't had any issues. Um, on the theoretical side, that the things that might go wrong, that hasn't yet gone wrong, but they might go wrong, is that um, if you have, let's say you have five nodes um, and three of them for some reason become unreachable and you, have, you can reach two of them, um, from your computer and you say, I want to promote another node to become another master, it might be that these other three nodes um, that they are actually still running, they just split away so they will come back and then you will have a bad time. But if they all crashed, then you can safely add in more masters. So, so there's some edge cases like this that we, uh, as an operator, you need to pay a bit of attention to this stuff. Does that add into your question? Yeah. What's another question there? Um, I, I guess the biggest challenge we had was to, to make proper mess up 
the order of messages and mess up the delay of messages and so on in, in a way that w w made sense, kind of. So you want it to be totally random and totally mess up everything, but not just send uh, um, like Byzantine failures, kind of. So it was very hard for us to describe what could go wrong in a legitimate way and what could just be like a bad user, kind of. Um, with that said, though, we, the, the, we couldn't find any bugs with proper, which was kind of like a bit weird. Uh, so what I did was I would put in certain bugs that I would know about in the code, and then we would see, okay, if Locky would find those, or if proper would find those, and it did. Um, but there might be more things that, the, there might be more bugs that Locky did not find because of the same reason. Sounds like you need Pulse or something like that. Pulse? Uh, well, the other part of the question is about Pulse. Okay, okay. So any more questions? Um, so we use Jim Meter a lot yeah. for Meter election. Um, it's not the most reliable thing in the world. Yeah. Did you guys ever look at that? Yeah. Um, we, we never used it, um, but we had a look at it. Um, uh, so and also our impression was it was not the most reliable um, because also the algorithm is, is quite complex. Yeah. Um, and the project state is very confusing. There's like a nine million forks and there's some effort to pull them all together and so on. And some of them support th that you can add more nodes that can become leaders. And I think some of them say that you cannot do that. Right. Once you start it up. You all the nodes before you start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And f for us, this was like, work, yeah. didn't really work out. Interesting. I just wanted to see if you looked at it the same thing. Yeah. And we looked at Doocer, uh, practice yeah. implementation in Go from Heroku. And it's, uh, Heroku right now. But they're not actually using it, and it's more of a toy product, and it's full of bugs. And we had a team that evaluated it, and, and uh, it was a lot of bugs that, okay, it would not actually propagate stuff to replicas and so on. Um, and we also were th thinking about using DynamoDB, um, which has uh, conditional rights, and then implementing our own replication on top of this thing. But this was also uh, very hard to do. Thanks.